So, uh, okay, so first let me say thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to tell you about uh, what I'm working on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, what I'll be talking about today is a uh, top-down approach to quantum fields. And um, <clears throat> please interrupt me if you have questions. I'm happy to kind of uh, just, you know, add if you want. Uh, so what is this talk going to be about? Um, it's going to be about uh, quantum field theory on the one hand, abbreviate as a QFT. And on the other hand, the other aspect of it that I'm going to be talking about is string theory. And the, the top-down uh, uh, approach is that I'll be telling you about how we can go from the world of string theory uh, to quantum field theory and learn new things about uh, quantum fields in the process. And conversely, uh, things we know about quantum field theory often surprisingly uh, can tightly constrain uh, proper uh, the higher energy world or the short distance world. But I'll uh, primarily keep that uh, last arrow a bit implicit. Okay, so what is string theory? Um, there's actually not a complete uh, working definition of what it is, um, otherwise I'd be happy to talk about that instead. Uh, rather, it's a work in progress. And by that, I mean that there's new things being discovered about uh, kind of the mathematical and physical uh, foundations of the So at that level, uh, you know, what we do is we have progress and so we can use that working definition to uh, provide us with um, what we mean by uh, the system. Okay. What about quantum field theory? Now, this is uh, a subject that's been around for quite a bit longer than string theory. Uh, and so, you know, you can trace the origins of it back probably I'd say to even like the 1930s or so. Uh, so it's almost a century old at this point, um, but it's also a work in progress. Um, and by this, I mean that we're still also discovering new things about quantum fields. And in fact, uh, as I'll try to explain in this talk, uh, using methods from string theory, we're learning new things about uh, quantum field theory. So what we mean by quantum field theory, our conception of quantum fields in general uh, continues to expand. Uh, and I'll try and touch on some of that uh, as we go. What I will talk about is basically how to use string theory to discover completely new kinds of quantum field theories, and in fact, calculate new things in both new quantum field theories and known quantum field theories using methods from uh, string theory. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, here's the main idea. And let me turn on the laser pointer. Uh, as you may know, uh, strings start off in basically 10 space time dimensions. And to construct various quantum field theories, what we do is we consider kind of taking the geometry of those extra dimensions and uh, doing something non-trivial with them. So if we take uh, four out of these 10 extra dimensions and make them curved in some way, then uh, we can arrive at what are known as a special class of uh, quantum field theories known as 6D SCFDs, or six dimensional supercomponent field theories. And I'll explain more precisely what these things are and why they kind of play a central role in a lot of uh, uh, new developments in the study of quantum field theory. And then, as we go on, what we're going to see is that <clears throat> as you go to lower, uh, say, four or fewer dimensions, you get uh, you can actually use what you learned about six-dimensional systems by taking some of these directions to, to learn new things about four-dimensional uh, and lower. OK. So here's my plan for the talk. First, I'll tell you about uh, kind of things that happen in kind of textbook quantum field theories, if you like. Then I'll discuss uh, uh, finding new quantum field theories using string. And then I'll send, uh, zero in on six dimensional SCFTs and then uh, applications to uh, lower dimensional uh, quantum field theories. And then I'll conclude with some summary in future. Uh, so um, for the experts, uh, I, I should say, uh, if you're an expert in string theory or something like that, then you may be a bit bored by what I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> but uh, hopefully uh, uh, you'll find some of it entertaining. Uh, okay, so let me begin with uh, textbook uh, quantum field theory. Um, so, uh, it has a huge variety of applications, uh, and they're used by many, many different kinds of physicists and mathematicians. So, for example, uh, if you want to uh, predict what happens at various experiments, such as the ATLAS experiment, uh, then you use the formalism of quantum field theory to define what you mean by preparing uh, you know, initial states and what are the possible ways that you can compute probabilities for things that might be generated after uh, possible scattering events. So. Um, Particle physics is one of these places where quantum field theory is heavily used, even calculates predictions that are expected. Mm -hmm. Cosmology is another example. Um, so, uh, for example, if we consider, uh, you know, the Big Bang and the theory of the Big Bang, what do we do? We're actually using, in many cases, 
uh, uh, methods from quantum field theory to calculate, for example, how various relic abundances for both observed particles and proposed new particles might be generated and cool down to generate uh, what we see uh, at present times. And um, if you imagine even going before, say, the Big Bang uh, through proposals such as inflation or some other kind of uh, uh, very early time uh, early universe cosmology, then uh, perturbations in these kinds of systems can be calculated using quantum fields and provide the seeds for generating uh, perturbations that are used to produce things that later uh, are structure formation and so on at later times. So this is another example of kind of how quantum fields uh, get applied in a very non-trivial way. Okay. Uh, so as a final example, I'll mention uh, condensed matter systems. Uh, so again, I'm just picking you know, an example that I like to talk about. And here, this is the famous plot uh, from fractional quantum Hall effect, where here I've what are known as the uh, Hall resistivity. And over on the side, we have, uh, uh, over on the x-axis, we have like the applied energy control. And you can study many aspects of the system using uh, suitable low energy effective uh, field theories, uh, quantum field theories. So these are samplings of uh, possible applications one can talk about uh, the ways in which quantum fields are known to uh, be of use and uh, can be uh, applied fruitfully. Okay, so what do I mean by quantum field theory? Uh, let's give a more uh, proper definition. So it's quantum, uh, so Q. Excuse me, let me check. QFT really used in particle physics too, or condensed matter to computer prediction? Well, I doubt it. Uh, uh, yes, it's used all the time. Uh, so I can assure you that quantum field theory is used heavily in, in both uh, subjects to make predictions about what you will see. Uh, so. Uh, so please ask me again if, uh, if uh, 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 in the questions after this. Okay, so it's quantum uh, and it has states, uh, Hilbert space, and it has uh, operators, which I'll write as uh, O hat. Uh, <clears throat> and we have these operators acting on states. And when we talk about a field theory of some kind, uh, we mean that it's local. So uh, the operators depend on both positions in space, as I've written here by a vector X and time, I'll write that as T. So examples of this include like electric fields and uh, magnetic fields. So for example, you know, just ordinary electromagnetism of some kind. Okay, and it also has uh, observables. Uh, so for example, uh, these O's are associated with measure in the lab and you compute expectation values to compute probabilities uh, for you know, what you'll actually see. And so you take products of these operators like so and you have sandwiched them between states. So here I've written in so-called Brockett notation. So uh, if you like, this is an element of your uh, Hilbert space, the psi prime, and then we have uh, uh, pairing it uh, using the inner product uh, from the Hilbert space with another state psi. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, quantum field theory or any uh, system, really, uh, not just the quantum systems, uh, the things that we actually care about in the system uh, greatly depend on the length scales of, uh, that we're uh, talking about. So the states and operator that interest, uh, as I'm saying here, depend quite heavily on the scale, for example, water molecules. Um, so here I've indicated like at very long distances, you could imagine you're surfing a wave or something like that. And this entire wave of water is composed of little water molecules and you can go inside of one of them. I'm not sure this is actually an oxygen uh, atom, but you know, close enough. And you can go inside the oxygen atom and consider the nucleus and then a proton or something like that and a quark within that. So the quantum field theory you would use to describe, for example, the physics of quarks versus even associated with you know, something at longer distances is heavily dependent on what length scale you're actually talking about. <clears throat> okay, so here's the tool for calculating in uh, textbook quantum field theory. Uh, we often have what we call uh, the path integral formalism. So we have some starting uh, finishing state and we wanna know what is, what is the probability that we could go from here to here. So we perform some sum over paths, some exponential of e to the i s, and uh, we weight it by some appropriate action, this uh, integral over Lagrangian of time. So you imagine just summing over all possible paths as you go from the start to the finish. Okay, so this Lagrangian, I uh, wrote it here, L, is a useful thing to talk about in both classical and quantum physics. So in uh, you know, classical physics, what do we instruct to talk about usually? We write down an action and we write down a kinetic minus a potential energy. And as you know, a very simple example, you can talk about say the physics of a harmonic oscillator, say something oscillating like a spring. Here we say like the mass and the spring constant. And so a textbook definition of quantum field theory that you will often see is that, well, what you're really 
talking about a large number of quantum mechanical harmonic oscillators that interact with each other. There might be more uh, complicated interaction terms at higher orders. Uh, but in some sense, a lot of what you understand about quantum fields can be boiled down to starting with just decoupled harmonic oscillators and then perturbing and considering interactions, perturbations around that uh, starting point. So here are some questions you might have about uh, quantum field theory. Number one, uh, do all quantum field theories have a Lagrangian? Operationally, right, my definition or how I was thinking about uh, manipulating things just required me to state some local operators and then compute expectation values. In that level, the path integral is just some really convenient way to start computing things. Uh, number one, do all quantum field theories have a Lagrangian? Or more precisely, do you have a useful Lagrangian that you can actually uh, use to compute anything with? Um, how do you go from short to long distances? Uh, so in other words, can we actually track uh, the behavior of a physical system as we go from uh, short distance physics to long distance physics? And what can you actually calculate in uh, these systems? So here I'll talk about uh, finding new theories. So now I'm gonna start moving beyond what we typically talk about in textbook examples and start moving on to uh, kind of how you would go about finding new ones. Okay, so finding new QFTs. So here's a surprise from string theory. Uh, surprise number one, only a tiny fraction of the quantum field theories that we know about, uh, that we now know about have a Lagrangian. In fact, the vast majority either have a Lagrangian, which is not very useful for calculations, or we don't even know what the Lagrangian even looks like. Um, of course, this is a bit of a time dependent statement, uh, but it's still true that at present, uh, a tiny fraction appeared to not have, only a tiny fraction appear to be covered by what we would say are textbook uh, methods. Um, Surprise number two is that even though we don't have a Lagrangian in many cases of interest, it's still possible to do uh, interesting calculations and to extract uh, non-trivial correlation functions. And I'll, I'll give some examples uh, of those as we go. Uh, okay, so what are strings? Uh, so again, this is probably uh, uh, easy for the string theorists, but so be it. Uh, uh, we can talk about different kinds of strings. They can either have endpoints. Uh, I'll refer to these as like open strings, and you can also have loops that look like closed strings. Uh, so closed strings are famous because uh, they often allow us to study things related to quanta of gravity, so-called gravitons. And these other ones are often used uh, in building models that involve, uh, say, electrons, quarks, or more complicated uh, uh, things like that. And then vibrations of these strings tell us about, for example, particles uh, uh, at, low in at long distances or low energies. Okay, so it's helpful at the smallest scales to do this. And you can consider, for example, thought experiments where you consider, say, electrons exchanging gravitons. So time is running from left to right uh, in the Feynman diagram notation. And uh, if you start doing this calculation at very high energies, what you observe, if you try and treat everything still as point particles, is that the probabilities start to uh, diverge at extremely high energies. And by contrast, in the context of, say, stringy scattering, uh, what one finds is that the probabilities uh, behave better. And part of the reason for this is that roughly it's not the uh, collision of two kind of point-like objects, but rather they are spread out a little bit uh, spatially. Um, and so here, a graviton, as I mentioned, is replaced by a closed string. And I've kind of tried to indicate uh, kind of crudely with my picture here uh, how that kind of uh, scattering process would work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in the context of uh, what I'll be talking about, I'll be interested in starting from the world of string theory and taking various types of limits to get various types of quantum field theories. And depending on how I take such scaling limits, I could imagine I get various types of quantum field theories. And the point is that a lot of these scaling limits lead us to quantum field theories that don't appear to have kind of conventional textbook uh, definitions. Okay, so let's, let's see how we go about doing that. Uh, so the idea is basically to convert, if you like, uh, geometry of the extra dimensions uh, predicted by string theory into physical uh, quantities of interest. So what do strings predict? They predict uh, 10 space-time dimensions or nine, nine spatial and one time. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to build a four-dimensional quantum field theory, you could consider doing something with six out of those ten directions. So you would consider some complicated geometry here. I've tried to indicate that by this uh, stuff here. And this would allow you to build, say, a 4D uh, space-time, say, like Minkowski space and four space-time dimensions. And you could say, I want to, by studying uh, geometry over here, specify what I mean by a quantum field theory on the 4D space. And, you know, there's no limit. You could talk about not just 4D. You could talk about a 3D space time. And in this case, we would say, well, there's some seven uh, dimensional, extra dimensional geometry we're specifying, uh, which tells me that's more about a 3D system. Okay, so you can characterize via topology. Um, and so this, uh, you know, just indicating a couple of Riemann surfaces, like genus one or genus two, so on. 
Uh, and so the reason we have to do this in practice is that actually solving uh, Einstein's field equations or some you know, stringy correction to that on the extra dimensional system is actually typically very, very hard. And so one actually usually has to fall back on kind of topological uh, conditions, which are uh, uh, much easier to study uh, to actually specify existence of how these compactifications uh, for lower dimensional systems work. So we can't uh, usually solve directly the full, uh, full blown uh, uh, system. <clears throat> and so we have to instead resort to uh, kind of topological conditions. Good question in chat. How do you know that these QFTs exist in any meaningful sense since they are supposed to be interacting? I don't think you can really construct a Hilbert space in the algebra of operators in an obvious way. On the other hand, for ordinary QFTs, we have lattice constructions as in QCD or at least perturbative extensions as in standard, as in the standard. Um, yeah, so um, I would say that there isn't really a mathematically sharp uh, definition of what one means by quantum field theory in general. And part of the aim here is to discover uh, kind of more features of what we could expect quantum field theory to look like. Uh, I also mentioned that um, there's a huge number of quantum field theories that resist being placed on a lattice. So um, I would not use a lattice definition as your gold standard for uh, defining quantum field theory. There's lots of interesting quantum field theories that uh, do not conveniently fit on a lattice. So, um, so anyway, uh, anyway, this is an open problem and, the, and in fact motivates uh, kind of what we're looking for. So what we can do is we can, we can look for kind of evidence for these things uh, as, we, as I would as a physicist. I look for evidence of all these things. I don't have a sharp mathematical you know, axiomatic definition but you know, that's what distinguishes, I would say, doing physics from like pure math. So um, anyway, that's, that's the sense in which I'll mean existence. I'll, I'll provide you evidence that we have for these things. Uh, so I hope that answers the, uh, the question. Okay, so let me keep going. So in practice, we characterize via topology. Um, and here's a more elaborate example. I won't go into the guts of uh, F theory. Perhaps I should have considering the mathematical tastes of the audience, but Here's an example. Uh, you can start considering characterizing existence of uh, these, uh, these kinds of compactifications using Yao's theorem, for example, which allows us to establish that there does exist some kind of uh, HE flat metric in many cases. And in particular, elliptically fibered Calabi Yao uh, manifolds provide uh, a, a nice machine for generating examples that I'll be uh, implicitly using in, in some of what I'll talk about. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example of, for example, uh, the an elliptically fibered Calabi Yao. It has some base and it has some elliptic fibers and then they, the uh, fibers can degenerate at various uh, loci as I've indicated here. Okay, so Lagrangian examples. Uh, we know how to build Lagrangians, uh, for example, for uh, things like elementary particle physics, like the standard model. Uh, at this point, it's kind of a, a worldwide industry. Uh, so I, I won't go into too much detail here. It's what I did my PhD thesis on in, in large part. Um, so here's a picture of the particles of the standard model. Uh, but there's many other kinds of uh, quantum field theories that you can generate, uh, which uh, are of this type, like basically some kind of Lagrangian approximation of some kind <clears throat> uh, that you might want to uh, talk about. Okay. So here, what I want to do is kind of focus on the things that don't have Lagrangian and explain uh, the sense in which they make sense uh, from this perspective. So beyond textbook uh, quantum field. Okay. So here are my simplifying assumptions. Uh, I'm going to start, uh, as is common in physics, with uh, something simple and then try to perturb away from it. Okay, so I will keep gravity, uh, quote unquote, switched off, and I'll consider a limit in which uh, there actually are not even any mass scales or length scales. And these are uh, going to lead me to particular kinds of quantum field theories that enjoy what's known as conformal symmetry. Uh, and I'll make another further simplifying assumption, which will make it easier to find examples. Uh, which is that these theories will be supersymmetric. And the last one, which may, may be a little bit less uh, uh, natural sounding, is that uh, it'll actually be easier to simplify by starting up in six space-time dimensions. And I'll try to explain why this is uh, a simplifying assumption and not a complicating assumption. Okay, so turning off gravity, uh, here's the main idea. Uh, you remember that I mentioned there's two kinds of open strings roughly that we can talk about. There's ones that have endpoints, which we call these uh, open strings. And then there's kind of these closed loops, these gravitons that can kind of wander around. So if we want to kind of focus on things related to quantum fields and not necessarily quantum gravity, we want to be able to isolate our uh, discussion and just talk about uh, open strings uh, themselves. Okay. So the idea is that uh, so long as we kind of focus our attention over here, we don't need to pay attention to all the complications happening elsewhere in the uh, extra dimensional geometry. And the reason we can get away with this in some cases is because the closed string uh, can kind of wander away, and the odds that it will actually ever find our little, little tiny little patch where the open strings are hooked onto uh, 
decreases as we make the volume of this extra dimensional space uh, very large. <clears throat> okay, so turning off gravity, uh, what's the idea? So roughly speaking in four dimensions, you just have Newton's constant going like uh, one over the volume of the extra dimensions. <clears throat> And consequently, as we start taking this volume very big, we can start uh, diluting the effects of gravity. So that's how we switch off gravity in these settings. So even though we're talking about extra dimensions, there's a sense in which these extra dimensions are actually rather big. And we're just localizing everything in this uh, little tiny patch of our extra dimensional geometry. So this is a simplifying assumption because it doesn't mean we have to build like a global model or a global uh, geometry over here. You can just focus on the behavior near some uh, special little region. Okay, conformal symmetry, uh, how about that one? So conformal field theories are useful in a large number of physical systems. Uh, they're useful, for example, in modeling things associated to phase transitions, for example, how water boils, um, critical phenomena of various kinds. Um, it also shows up, shows up in uh, very elementary particle physics scenarios for things that might be seen uh, at higher energy. And it, uh, and perhaps most famously nowadays, it uh, it figures very prominently in uh, the so-called ADS CFT correspondence, which provides us a kind of an operational definition of mean by um, <clears throat> uh, quantum gravity in certain space-time backgrounds. Okay, so more more general uh, quantum field theories can be constructed by considering perturbations of these conformal field theories. So you can perturb a CFT that doesn't have any details. If you like, start deforming it, perturbing it in some way to consider quantum field theory. So you should think about this similar to when I was talking about water those water molecules and those atoms going from very short distances, so short distances up here, to longer distances down here. And if you kind of take a scaling limit of this thing to go to even longer distances, then you often find yet another CFT. Um, it may be a boring one, but you often find a, yet another uh, CFT. In this context. Okay. So that covers uh, switching off gravity and conformal symmetry. This last one, supersymmetry, uh, is uh, still a very important symmetry in the context of uh, uh, theoretical investigation. With something like bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom, it's still one of the main drivers for uh, new physics search at CERN. Um, and for my purposes today, where I'm not going to be so interested in uh, particle physics models per se, uh, it's very helpful in us understanding uh, strongly coupled behavior in various uh, quantum systems. And that's really the use I'm going to use it. That's really the uh, way I'm going to use it uh, for much of this. Of course, in the future, one would like to study uh, more, more general kinds of quantum field theories. And that involves discussing uh, how you would break the symmetry. Um, but I won't really get into too much uh, detail there. And just a uh, quick questions. OK, so um, <clears throat> uh, there's a question in chat. So you restrict yourself at large volume limit in this talk so, such that you can use perturbative tools. There could be some other complicated non-geometric backgrounds, which are not at the large volume uh, limit. Uh, yeah, so the, the reason why I'm doing this decompactification is really to decouple gravity from the, uh, from the system. So I agree that there are, um, there are some, uh, uh, there are uh, definitely uh, string compactifications where you do not have such a limit available. But in those cases, I don't know how to uh, switch off gravity. Um, so that's an interesting question. Uh, so that's a, another kind of interesting question. Uh, uh, because uh, you know, there might be kind of non-trivial ways that you have to couple quantum field theory to gravity. And that's another kind of interesting uh, situation. Okay, I see another question in chat. Indeed, it is only a rule of thumb to get correlation functions. Oh, uh, so the background is just a scheme and nothing logically built. Sometimes it gives qualitative results. All right. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna ignore this. Uh, so we have super conformal field theories uh, and uh, we have supersymmetry and CFTs. And when we put them together, we get what are called um, SCFTs. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, the last, or let's now go to the last assumption, which is to start in uh, six space-time dimensions. And uh, here, <clears throat> uh, you might ask, why is this a simplifying um, assumption at all? Okay, so why is six-dimensional simple? Uh, it sounds like it's the most complicated thing you could do from the perspective of studying a quantum field theory. Um, so the point is that uh, from the perspective of a string compactification construction, it's actually the other way around. The more uh, dimensions you add in the extra dimensional geometry, the more complicated the types of geometries you're actually allowed to uh, consider and construct. And the fewer extra dimensions you have, or the, uh, it becomes less complicated. So let's contrast it. Suppose you were interested in constructing a four dimensional quantum field theory. 
you have to contend with the six extra dimensions. So for example, in the specific context where the six extra dimensions are a Calabi-Yau space, you have to specify um, some kind of Calabi-Yau threefold. And there's lots and lots of different possibilities there. And there's lots of ways of taking uh, various types of deep compactification limits and uh, singular limits of these six extra dimensional geometry. On the other hand, if you talk about six space-time dimensions, you only have four extra dimensions. Again, sticking to the case of Calabi-Yau spaces, whereas there's a huge number of Calabi-Yau threefolds, there's essentially only one that you get to talk about here, a K3 surface. So this makes it a lot less complicated in terms of building things. Of course, you can generalize away from just talking about Calabi-Yau's for here and here, and we will in fact do a bit of that. Uh, but the point here is that uh, it should be clear that you're getting uh, a less complicated system or setup when you have these uh, six space-time dimensions to uh, play with. Okay. So here's the bridge again. We started with 10 dimensions and something we're gonna do involving six dimensional CFTs uh, will lead us to this. And then we go down to uh, four dimensional uh, quantum field theory. Okay, so now let me get straight to uh, talking about six dimensional CFTs. So this was at kind of some, some kind of like very qualitative level so far about how you find the QFTs. We just say, well, I need to tell you about some extra dimensional ingredients of some kinds and putting them together, I will build you some examples. So now I'm gonna tell you how you can do this in practice and really uh, perform a, a nearly systematic analysis of all possible 60 SCFTs. Okay, so 60 SCFTs, um, why are these special? They're so special, and one of the reasons they're so special is that in fact, one can basically by just using symmetry arguments show that there are no CFTs if you go above six space-time dimensions. So this is a famous result from uh, Werner Nam back in the 1970s. Um, so six is kind of the maximal space-time dimension in which you can even raise the question that I'm talking about. Uh, now, having raised the question, you might ask, can you find examples? And in fact, no examples were really known until the 1990s. Uh, and they were found basically using methods from uh, string theory. And in fact, all the known uh, examples, <clears throat> uh, so by that I mean they are not simply uh, small perturbations of you know, weakly coupled harmonic in some way. Another way, a more formal way to say this is they are definitely not small perturbations of a Gaussian fixed point of any kind. Uh, they are very far away from uh, that kind of system. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is explain you know, how to build them. And I'll also explain, hopefully, uh, the sense in which they're helpful in studying both non-Lagrangian and Lagrangian uh, quantum field theories that you encounter in uh, uh, four or fewer space-time dimensions. Okay, so roadblocks for 60 CFTs. Um, basically a handful of examples were discovered in the 1990s. Um, I'm just listing a few papers, but there's, there's lots more. Um, I can't give a complete list uh, here, but these are kind of three uh, kind of foundational work er, uh, papers in this area. Lagrangians are unknown and there's not, there wasn't really a systematic way to construct these things and it remained stagnant for many, many years. Um, I don't know if that's just due to sociological stuff, uh, you know, basically in 96 or 97 or 97, uh, you know, KDSCFT occurred and like a huge uh, uh, shift occurred in the field. Um, so uh, who knows? Uh, anyway, it was stagnant for many years, uh, but now uh, there's a sense in which uh, we know quite a bit more about how these things work. So they've now been classified and I'll, set, uh, I'll explain the precise sense in which we have a classification now. And Lagrangian methods were not really necessary to do that. There's a method to construct all these things and I'll also mention uh, kind of completely new research directions that uh, uh, have been spawned as a result of, uh, or as a result of the classification scheme. So let me now go on to uh, classifying these things. So what do we do? To make a 60 CFT, we're gonna apply our simplifying assumption. So we start with 10 dimensional stringy geometry and we're gonna write it as some six dimensional space time and four extra dimensions. And the CFT limit amounts to taking in this four extra dimensional system all possible length scales to either zero size or infinite size. Okay, so let's turn off gravity. So we imagine uh, doing this limit where we just have the degrees of freedom that we're interested in trapped in this, uh, this area here. And then we can start collapsing the local region. So this, this step here is basically to switch off gravity, but you haven't yet made a CFT because there could still be uh, you know, cycles of various sizes in the extra dimensions, which have finite volume or non-zero uh, in finite volume, right? This is a common situation we have, for example, when we consider resolution of uh, uh, ADE singularities of various kinds. Okay, so the uh, next step you have to do is take some limit where you shrink things down in this limit. And in the singular limit where all the other volumes have collapsed to zero size or also expanded off to infinite size, you reach a CFT, an SCFT. So what is collapsing in these uh, geometries? So um, I, I won't go into, uh, uh, 
too much of this, but I will mention a little bit. Um, in these four extra dimensions, we have collapsing uh, two spheres. In, in, in reality, they're actually uh, CP1s. And if you want, you can visualize it as here is your six space-time dimension, and you have four extra dimensions, and there's two directions which are kind of normal to the, uh, to the two sphere of interest. And so this volume of this uh, two sphere is collapsing to a zero size. Uh, a little bit more mathematically, or probably maybe not mathematically enough for some of you here. <laughs> uh, you have basically, you can view it, visualize it in terms of one complex uh, direction tangent to it and normal to it. And basically all we're doing is we're considering some complex curve and we're collapsing that complex curve to uh, zero size. So the simplest six DCFTs just correspond to a single two sphere collapsing to uh, zero size. And uh, in fact, one can show uh, in the models I'm talking about, uh, or, or in more generally, so uh, for the uh, experts, this is associated with type 2b uh, with varying axial dilaton or F theory. The, there's, a, there's a bound uh, uh, on the uh, normal directions on how uh, curved the normal bundle can be. And so uh, basically there is a bound which goes from basically one to 12. This is associated with minus the self-intersection number of the curve inside of the four extra dimensions. Um, and so it runs from say less curved to uh, more curved. Okay, now you can move on to having more than one two sphere. And that looks a bit like this, uh, where you have two of these uh, two spheres and they're intersecting at say some point. And in fact, one can show that uh, in the case of CFTs where you demand that these things can all collapse simultaneously in the metric of uh, in the moduli space of Calabria threefolds, that uh, two spheres that intersect can only intersect at uh, a single point. And so you label these two spheres by both you know, if they intersect or not, and also by uh, their self-intersection, or actually here I'm indicating minus the self-intersection. Okay, so here are the building blocks for building more complicated geometry. You essentially have what I'll refer to as atoms and radicals. And each of these things that just involves some configuration of collapsing two spheres inside of the four dimensional extra dimensions, uh, four extra dimensions. And so what's going on here is that there's specific uh, self-intersection numbers associated to each of these uh, um, curves. And then you can also have different kinds of uh, self-intersection numbers I've written here. Uh, so basically the numbers four, six, seven, eight, and 12 kind of always appear like as isolated atoms. And then there's particular repeating structures that always appear uh, in this uh, analysis of classifying these 60 CFTs, which appear as these uh, repeating patterns of uh, spheres with uh, prescribed uh, self-intersection numbers. So here's the classification of geometries. What I'm drawing here is again, a, a configuration of collapsing two spheres or spheres that will collapse once we, uh, uh, once we take some shrinking limit to make a CFT. And you think of you should think about these as just a bunch of two spheres inside of the four extra dimensions. And the whole point is that the non-trivial bit here is number one, finding all the different spheres that you can have. And number two, making sure that uh, we can solve the uh, corresponding uh, Einstein field equations or the string theory equations of motion to generate uh, these backgrounds in the first place. So they really do look like uh, simple molecules of this kind. And I, the thing I wanna stress here is that basically you just get a single spine of stuff with a little bit of decoration over here on the right and a little bit of decoration over here on the left. And you can extend this to like an infinite family, uh, which extends the making this part very, very long. Uh, but there is no decoration that can be added into the interior of this kind of molecule. So in that sense, it really does look like a very simple class of uh, what we might call molecules. So a little more technically, um, let me, uh, I put this slide in uh, for those who uh, would like to know more about this aspect. What we're doing is we're classifying uh, canonical singularities for non-compact elliptically fibered Calabria threefolds. Uh, so here's some base B, uh, it's non-compact. And the strategy for classification involves basically classifying the bases. And what one finds, uh, this is a non-trivial fact, is that they all look like orbifolds uh, by discrete, uh, discrete group actions by subgroups of U2. And then you're classifying uh, elliptic vibrations over the base. More precisely, you resolve this base. And then you consider all possible elliptic vibrations such that the total space is a Calabria threefold, a non-compact uh, Calabria threefold. <clears throat> So that's, that's really what we're doing in terms of the classification. And then the non-trivial surprise is that when you do this, the base geometries always look like these configurations of collapsing surfaces. Uh, a priori, it could have been a much more complicated situation, but this is what we get uh, from the classification. Okay, so how about uh, uh, this general plan I was talking about taking a CFT and perturbing it, making a new QFT and then perturbing again. These are what we would refer to in physics as renormalization group flows and going from short distances to long distances. You can do this also, and you can study various kinds of flows. Um, uh, 
there, there's also some work in progress that I won't mention today. Uh, some exciting work in progress with uh, Kundu and Zheng, uh, which will hopefully be done uh, relatively soon uh, on studying some aspects of uh, these flows. So an interesting feature of this is that you can now start thinking about these molecules and asking what happens if I start you know, uh, deforming the geometry in various ways. These deformations were either by blowups or smoothing deformations of the geometry correspond <clears throat> to uh, renormalization group flows in the six dimensional uh, setting. So you can kind of split these molecules apart. We refer to this as kind of a fission operation. And you can even consider what happens if you uh, take these uh, RG flows kind of in reverse and go kind of like back up into short distances. And this is kind of what we would call a fusion operation of some kind. And doing this, you can actually start sweeping out all the possible ways of going from uh, short distance to uh, long distance uh, phenomena in, the, in this world of six dimensional uh, SCFTs. Okay, so fission, uh, it turns out, can actually be in many cases uh, packaged in terms of uh, uh, the nilpotent cone of uh, elements inside of a Lie algebra. Uh, an example of this involves, say, the lowering operator of an ordinary uh, angular momentum in SU2 algebra. And basically, uh, there's these lowering operators, and these lowering operators directly correspond to different kinds of deformations that flow, from, flow you from one CFT, one fixed point, to another one. And as you do this, you can get more complicated uh, flows as you go down. So this is, again, just a, you know, a, a caricature of what's actually going on. Let me give an example uh, in practice. Uh, so I'll mention that the, there's a great amount of work done by uh, these folks on uh, uh, classifying this or showing explicitly how this works in some examples. So here is an example where you start with one CFT and you start flowing in different ways. And the point is that you have an algebraic classification of all the possible ways you can do this. So each one of these little boxes here corresponds to a CFT. The arrows correspond to the flows. And the point is that using what we know about the nilpotent cone of, uh, of uh, Lie algebras, in this case, it's associated to uh, <coughs> SO8 uh, Lie algebra on the left and the right, uh, you can start actually sweeping out the full list of possible flows as you go down. And these pink boxes and these dashed lines are just things that happen as you get to the bottom of the flow and you cannot flow any further. Okay, now uh, this is just in terms of like calcul uh, uh, this depicting like all the possible flows as you go from uh, short uh, to long distances. You can also do a number of uh, non-trivial calculations even though uh, we don't know how to write down Lagrangians for these systems. Um, so recall, what you really need is to be able to talk about operator correlation functions. So one thing that you can extract uh, is uh, something involving what's known as an anomaly. Um, and these are very nice uh, kind of observables to look at. And the reason they're nice is because they're completely controlled by the topology and the intersection theory of what's going on in the extra dimensional system. Um, so I'll mention that there was a method kind of uh, proposed here. And uh, oh, I should also put in a 2020 here. Uh, uh, they just recently released their proof for justifying this procedure that was proposed here. Uh, but using it, you can uh, uh, start computing uh, all the kinds of anomalies in the system. So this is an example of what we call like an anomaly of a zero form symmetry. And one of the areas which is kind of uh, being uh, investigated right now is how this works for uh, anomalies involving higher form symmetries and the associated uh, topology, <coughs> uh, topological structures that uh, interplay with that. Okay. You can calculate even more. Uh, let me mention just one example of this kind. So if you look at this, uh, this molecule that I was mentioning, which is depicting um, this uh, 60 CFT, it looks a lot like a one-dimensional system of some kind. Right? In fact, you can make that more precise and uh, show that there actually is a, there is a, a genuine like one-dimensional system sitting there. And it's associated with uh, something that shows up uh, you know, in statistical mechanics and some condensed matter toy models involving what's known as a spin chain. And in fact, one can show that uh, the spins in this associated spin chain are associated to the uh, degrees of homogeneity of uh, scaling uh, behavior in the, in the corresponding Calabi-Yau. So I'm not explaining where I got this from, but basically in some cases, the geometry just gives you spin plus or minus a half. So that would be the ordinary uh, Heisenberg spin chain uh, that one uses to study various kinds of quantum magnets. Uh, but you can consider more complicated things where the spin is actually quite a bit higher. And these are associated to more elaborate uh, and complicated uh, Calabi-Yau geometries, which we also know about from these systems. So you get these spins, one basically for each uh, link here. And then you can ask, well, what do these things tell you about? These actually correspond to specific kinds of operators in the uh, 60 CFT. And in fact, uh, this is the kind of uh, non-trivial result from this. Thing. One can show that these spins uh, correspond to particular uh, 
operators in the 60 CFT and using the fact that we kind of know about the Hamiltonian for these things, you can, you can actually calculate the mixing terms for these operators. One can show that scaling dimensions for these operators uh, like correspond to energies of the spin chain. Um, and in fact, one can also show that these things, or there's strong hints, at least at leading order in perturbation theory, that in the limit where the spin chain is really, really long, that it's governed by an integrable uh, spin chain. Uh, and you can solve that exactly uh, using the so-called uh, beta onsets and the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, integrable, uh, sorry, algebraic uh, version of it developed by uh, Fediev and co uh, collaborators in uh, Clinton grad school. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but this is just an example of something that's, uh, uh, we just discovered uh, this, uh, this summer and we're continuing to investigate now later uh, more about uh, integrability in these kinds of uh, systems. So this kind of provides a window into the actual operator content of uh, these things that's not necessarily controlled by purely topological uh, considerations. Okay, so I've told you now uh, almost everything I wanna say about 60 CFPs. I have a few minutes remaining, so I'd like to tell you now about uh, things that can happen in lower dimensional quantum field theories. So how do you make a lower dimensional quantum field theory? So you basically take the six dimensional system and you make some of those dimensions small. So it's basically playing the same game we played with 10 going to six, except now we're starting in six and going to even lower dimensions. So we have five, four, three, two, one. And if you want to get a corresponding 5D theory, you make one dimension small, 4D theory, you make two small and so on down the line. Let me talk about this one here. Um, you can consider a bunch of uh, ways of making six dimensional theories and going uh, compactifying on various Riemann services. And if you compactify, for example, on uh, spaces that have a positive curvature, you often do not get a CFT in four dimensions. You often get things that might confine or have some other kind of strong, uh, strong coupling infrared dynamics. Uh, I might refer to these as what we would call dark uh, QCDs or examples of uh, quark models. Okay, there's also six dimensional theories you can place on higher genus Riemann surfaces. And kind of the rule of thumb is that once you place it on a geometry that has a, a negative, a section, a negative curvature, then you often produce a uh, so corresponding uh, superconformal field theory. So there's now like basically uh, almost like a machine for generating four dimensional starting from the six dimensional setting. So you place them on these kind of geometries. There can be various marked points where you have to specify more details of kind of boundary conditions for operators in the extra dimensions. But doing this, you can make a lot of uh, new four dimensional uh, theories. Okay, now you can also make much more complicated uh, kind of molecular structures if you like from the extra dimensional geometry. So the reason why we can expect it to be a bit more complicated is because remember before when we were talking about six dimensions, we had just four extra dimensions. Now when we're down in four physical space-time dimensions, we have six extra dimensions and the corresponding molecules are therefore a bit more uh, complicated. So instead of just getting like a one-dimensional spine, uh, you now get things that look, uh, here's just an example uh, of a thing that can happen. So uh, these little uh, blue uh, numbers, I don't know if you can see them, these correspond to kind of the two normal bundle directions of these uh, CP1s inside of uh, a full six extra dimensions. And then all this other data is associated with various kinds of ways that you have elliptic fibration generated. Uh, so each of these faces corresponds to a specific uh, behavior for an elliptic fiber uh, in the model. Uh, the point being that uh, you can resolve these geometries. We don't have a full classification of what can happen here in four dimensions, but the point is that you get more complicated molecular structures uh, showing up. Okay. We can also calculate with no Lagrangian here. And again, I'll just mention uh, anomalies as an example. An anomaly can in some sense be thought of as uh, defined by, or these zero form anomalies can be thought of as defined by um, an eight form built from characteristic classes on a formally defined uh, eight dimensional space in which the six dimensional uh, space time is viewed as kind of like the boundary of a boundary of this eight dimensional uh, topological system. And if you integrate over two of those directions, integrate the, the background values of those characteristic classes over two out of the eight directions, you get a formal six form. And that's associated with a four dimensional anomaly. The point here is that you can actually calculate uh, all the kinds of anomalies you might wanna talk about in four dimensional system, starting from knowledge of what you know about the six dimensional uh, zero form anomalies. Okay, you can also apply these things to even build examples of kind of non-Lagrangian extra sectors. Um, this was in, in a sense, actually my original motivation for studying these things though my motivation has since changed a bit, but we can use this uh, to actually study uh, non-Lagrangian extra sectors. And you can actually calculate things once you know the anomalies. Here's an example, you can consider gluons and if they couple to uh, this ex some extra sector, which is non-Lagrangian and also couple to the Higgs, you can actually calculate the strength of this uh, interaction vertex here. So this would be controlling, for example, production rate of gluons uh, going to produce Higgses. 
And then similarly, you can ask about how Higgs's decay to photons. These things are controlled by anomalies uh, in some approximation. Uh, and you can also do a similar thing. So for example, this would tell you about gluons producing Higgs's and then going to uh, diphoton. Uh, you can calculate this to leading order uh, if you have such a model. You can also calculate, uh, for example, mixing of a visible photon with an extra sector dark photon. Again, this is something that's kind of controlled by uh, kind of extra dimensional uh, geometry. Okay. Well, let me say, uh, now I'm done with four dimensions. Let me move on to a three dimensional example. So you can start with a four dimensional theory as compactified on a Riemann surface. And you can start with another one on another Riemann surface. And you can consider, uh, if you like uh, formally a bordism that connects these two. And if you do this, if you try to write this in terms of a slicing of this three, three manifold uh, by just projecting down, because you're changing the genus, it's something very singular is happening right in the interior region. And one can argue on general topological grounds that there's additional degrees of freedom stuck uh, right where the single occurs. And so we considered some uh, examples of how that comes about uh, in this paper here, uh, but I anticipate actually doing a, a much more general example, a set of examples where you just take 60 CFTs and by considering these kinds of uh, uh, interpolating bordisms, uh, arguing for the existence of very kinds of rich uh, 3D interfaces uh, that are basically in between two four-dimensional uh, theories. So this is just another example of a thing you can do with this uh, setup. Okay, um, I'm almost out of time, so maybe I will actually jump over uh, the two-dimensional stuff. Um, the, maybe I'll just flash it quickly. Uh, you can consider going all the way down to two dimensions, and when you do this, you find that the coupling constants are not actually constant anymore. They're actually dynamical fields. And this involves studying uh, what happens to two-dimensional systems in which all the couplings uh, have now been promoted to dynamical fields. Um, and in particular, this is very notoriously complicated because, for example, things like the fine structure uh, you know, QED or something like that could now become order one, and it becomes very hard to study these kinds of systems. Using uh, kind of the six-dimensional perspective and, in fact, engineering it in 10 dimensions, one can gain insight into kind of the existence of a ground state here and also even compute some uh, correlation function. So, so again, some zero form anomalies. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. okay, that's another thing, but talking about higher dimensional quantum Hall effect uh, generalizations, but uh, I guess I'm almost out of time. So let me jump over that as well. And uh, let me now just move on to uh, summarizing and kind of some potential future uh, directions. Uh, to consider. So first let me just summarize. Uh, I have another slide uh, after this one. What was this talk about? So what I told you about is basically how you can go from the geometry of extra dimensions and string theory uh, and how to use that as a machine to generate new kinds of quantum field theories and derive new insights into those uh, systems. Um, I told you about classifying, studying these 60 CFTs, and then um, in the context of six dimensional systems, how to go to lower dimensional uh, QFT. Um, something that uh, has just started to be explored in this context is that uh, we've recently uncovered um, an op a subsector of uh, states in this uh, system which appear to be governed by an integrable system. Um, and whether this persists to higher orders uh, in perturbation theory in the length of the spin chain is a very interesting open problem. Um, but what we definitely have evidence for is that at leading order, there is some kind of integrability uh, showing up. So uh, this is an area that I kind of anticipate spending a bit more time uh, looking into uh, in the future. Um, now, what about the future? Um, the one thing that I would be very interested in doing uh, is, for example, taking all these SCFTs and trying to classify possible flows, uh, both in six dimensions and lower. So using this uh, geometric framework as a way of kind of studying this. As you go down to lower dimensions, this obviously becomes a much more uh, involved and nearly intractable problem. So for example, as you go down even to four dimensions, the number of quantum field theories one is dealing with uh, starts proliferating significantly. And so even classifying those things uh, is still kind of a very open problem. So using these kinds of systems, you can also ask, well, what kind of uh, new kinds of particle cosmology and condensed matter scenarios might you envision for this? This was actually something that, uh, in the context of particle physics applications, was one of my original motivations for studying these things. But I think it's you know turned into a subject in its own right of study. Um, and then uh, I'll let, I'll end with a very speculative direction, uh, which is you know can we use this to kind of help us get, get hints as to how to formulate uh, quantum field theory more generally? And I'll just mention briefly, just as an advertisement, that you know I've been recently speculating on this. There's a there's a note or some working paper available here. Uh, but I won't really talk about that uh, here. That would take uh, another hour or so to explain. Okay, so um, that's it for me. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to talk, take any questions. Uh, okay, 
Thank Johnson's great talk. And uh, so any question from the audience, please unmute yourself to us. Uh, okay, so uh, there's one question uh, uh, that was asked. Um, it's, is it known with some degree of confidence that 60 CFTs or any other don't have Lagrangian descriptions? Is there a reasonably persuasive argument why not? Or is it just that no Lagrangian description has been found so far? I, I would say that uh, <clears throat> what, what you can do is you can ask uh, how close can you come to writing down a Lagrangian? And this was actually the approach that uh, Cyberg took to provide uh, strong evidence that these things really were quantum field theories. So what Cyberg did was he looked at some very specific examples. He said, let's just talk about like SU2 gauge theory with some number of matter fields coupled to it, right? And so what he observed is that uh, when you try to go to the conformal limit, what's happening is that the value of the gauge coupling, the thing controlling the gauge interactions in that SU2 gauge theory is becoming formally infinite uh, in the limit where you're actually approaching the uh, conformal field theory. Uh, so the point is that um, there's, there's no good like effective field theory description going on here because you're going to like formally infinite uh, coupling constant when you reach the conformal fixed point. So basically all the examples that I told you about in terms of these molecular structures, if you deform away from the fixed point, you can write down a Lagrangian description of the associated low energy effective field theory. But the minute you try to, the moment you try to go back and to say, now what was the conformal fixed point? You're always extrapolating to infinite coupling in that gauge interact in those gauge interactions. And so that's the sense in which we say that there's not really a Lagrangian. There's other kind of indirect pieces, which is that there's like effective strings in these six dimensional theories. And these effective strings are always becoming tensionless uh, at the point. What this signals is that the, these strings are actually associated to some kind of emergent degrees of freedom. And the fact that they're emergent degrees of freedom also signals that there's difficulties with writing down kind of the microscopic description of, <coughs> uh, of the system. So I, hopefully that answers uh, 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 your question. Uh, that, that was to, I guess, uh, JL. Ah, there's a question also. Can you talk a bit about the generalized fractional quantum Hall effect you mentioned? Uh, yes, I can. Let me go back. Okay. Uh, so in ordinary quantum Hall effect, what do we do? Uh, there's a way of studying some aspects of it by uh, basically talking about a three-dimensional Chern-Simons theory. <clears throat> We talk about a three-dimensional Chern-Simons theory, and then uh, if we place this three-dimensional Chern-Simons theory on, say, a three-manifold with boundary, then we get some, uh, usually some chiral system, some 2D edge modes. And it's well known that there's, uh, in that standard uh, context, you can study aspects of, for example, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Laughlin wave functions, for example, uh, by considering what's going on with the three-dimensional uh, gap bulk. <clears throat> now, uh, you can do a similar thing in the of, uh, uh, some toy models of 60 CFTs. These aren't really like full-blown uh, uh, interacting systems, but they do have a close avatar. So in two dimensions, kind of the simplest example is like a, a two-dimensional chiral boson. And here, the idea is to look at, say, basically what we would call uh, a two-dimensional chiral two-form, sorry, a six-dimensional chiral two-form. <clears throat> and the point is that uh, this two-form has a three-form field strength, and you demand that this three-form field strength uh, is self-dual. So it's a self-dual three-form field strength. And that plays the analog of a 2D chiral boson. Now you can couple that system to a theory of three forms, abelian three forms in the bulk, and you can write down a, a churn simons like action C wedge DC, where C is a three form. So you make a, se uh, a seven form by taking C wedge DC. Now, rigorously defining that seven dimensional system is, is quite subtle, but even just using what we know about, you know, just basic facts about uh, how the Laughlin wave function is constructed in this case, you can stack, start to study, for example, braid statistics for, um, in this case, not really particles, but strings uh, or membranes over here, uh, and how as they bra braid around uh, using the seven-dimensional Chern-Simons theory. Uh, a very exciting open problem is to actually understand better uh, what is going on with the seven-dimensional gap bulk in like genuine 60 CFTs of the kinds I was talking about uh, earlier. So nobody really knows how to define what you'd mean by like a non-abelian theory of three forms, or even whether that's the appropriate language to speak about here. Um, but I suspect that this will provide a, a better like topological handle on how to formulate 60 CF. Uh, so that's kind of an open uh, question that would be, uh, I think, of interest to study further. Uh, so hopefully that answers uh, your question about talking about fractional quantum Hall effect a bit.
Okay, so quick question in 4D, and we could have Lagrangian. We know how to connect UV free theory to the IR CFT. Um, in 60C at 60, if we have no Lagrangian, how do we connect these uh, two points? So, um, so, so your question is like, how do we know about connecting uh, six-dimensional RG flows? If I understand uh, uh, correctly, so so the point is that the, the mileage we have uh, in understanding these things uh, really comes from the fact that we have a Calabria threefold geometry, and the point is that uh, we do know how we do have a characterization of. Uh, for these Calabria threefolds, in particular, the moduli space of these Calabria threefolds. So there's kind of two general kinds of deformations we can do for these singular Calabrias. One is a Kähler resolution, uh, and the other is a, a smoothing or complex structure deformation. And each of these corresponds to a particular kind of flow in the six-dimensional CFT. So, um, uh, so there's some nice work by Cordova, Dumitrescu, and uh, Intrilligator, which shows that for 60 CFTs at least, there's basically two ways you can imagine deforming a 60 CFT. One is called tensor branch flow and one is called Higgs branch flows. Uh, and each of these corresponds to a geometric operation in the Calabria context. So tensor branch flows are associated to uh, Kähler deformations um, where you basically take those collapsing two spheres and you let them expand to large size. And Higgs branch deformations correspond to the complex structure uh, deformations instead. So that's kind of how we kind of know that there are these 60 flows and we can connect different points uh, between them. And then you can do cross checks of the proposals by matching various kinds of anomalies uh, between the UV fixed point and the infrared fixed point. Um, so that's kind of uh, one way to make sure that you didn't make a mistake in, in the proposal for how the two CFT, the deformed CFT flows to another one. Um, okay, so the related naive question, if a QFT has a time evolution operator, what stops us from constructing a path integral in the usual way by splitting up amplitudes into short time intervals and why do we uh, not end up with a Lagrangian description that way? Or is it just that while this defines a Lagrangian description in principle, in the abstract, it doesn't provide a way to construct a Lagrangian uh, in practice? Is that the infinite couplings make it possible to write down a Lagrangian in terms of the uh, local degrees of freedom? Is it known that there is no other choice of degrees of freedom that would make it possible to write down a Lagrangian? So there's kind of two interrelated uh, complications with uh, uh, writing down a full-fledged uh, Lagrangian. One is that uh, at the level I told you about in terms of Cyberg's approach and just writing down a Lagrangian, you run into this difficulty, which is that you're at infinite coupling. So you might try to write down a path integral prescription for that gauge theory. Uh, there's another difficulty you run into, uh, which is related to a comment I was making earlier about uh, having difficulties with lattice formulations, uh, which is that really uh, trying to chop things up in this kind of like finite time step way uh, becomes complicated, especially in the context of uh, these bulk uh, three forms uh, in what you would even mean by these bulk three forms and their boundary two forms uh, in the context of specifying a path integral prescription. So in an interacting uh, CFT, there's, there, there is some work on how to do this for non-interacting uh, uh, self-dual two forms, uh, sorry, uh, chiral two forms. But uh, in the context of an interacting uh, system, it's, it's, it's very, well, it's unknown how to do it. Uh, and so uh, this is the other reason why it, it's not clear that there is like for example, a path integral, uh, a clean path integral formulation in the standard way, or uh, a lattice, especially like a. Um, so, uh, yeah, at some very, very general level, you can still talk about CFTs and radial quantization. And so you can still talk about defining, if you like, an evolution operator, like the dilatation operator. All that is totally fine and works in the standard way. And so, if you like, what we're actually doing uh, in this uh, discussion I had about spin chains is computing here. When you're computing these, uh, these scaling dimensions like this, you're actually computing the action of the dilatation operator on uh, physical states of the CFT. And so one is actually using this, implicitly trying to extract the analog of the uh, radial evolution uh, operator, which is kind of like the Hamiltonian operator in the radial quantized uh, scheme. So uh, in that sense, uh, we are trying to actually figure out uh, So not directly Lagrangian, but uh, more like the Hamiltonian. Okay, naive question number three, with the comprehensive classification of 60 CFTs, would there be a way to see if the exact 4D standard model can be obtained from a specific compactification of two of the extra dimensions? Or is there a way to show that it's not possible? Um, so my I, I suspect that you would not get the standard model or anything like it from compactifying these uh, 60 CFTs. Uh, they typically actually arise from things that are um, not really conformal fixed points in higher dimensions. Um, 
at least in all the constructions I know. Um, the utility of these 60 CFTs for like 40 particle physics models would be more like uh, strongly coupled uh, extra sectors, which could couple to the standard model, as I mentioned uh, over here. A part of the reason why uh, one suspects that they are not going to be that helpful for the standard model is that the standard model itself, uh, even though you might think that QCD is very strongly coupled and so on, at, at short distances it becomes weakly coupled. and um, these weakly coupled systems can be described by Lagrangians, Lagrangian field theories. And so, you know, even if you could write down a 60 CFT compactation of it, it's not 100% it's not clear what you would learn about uh, uh, that system by just doing that. Um, so uh, I suspect that you won't, you won't get it because most of the compactations you get from 60 CFTs are, are typically, uh, you know, strongly coupled or if they have a Lagrangian, they're, at, they're sitting at strong coupling. Um, and so I'm not sure it's directly relevant for, um, for that kind of question. It, it, it's more related to uh, different kinds of questions related to 4D quantum field theories. So not all quantum field theories from 10D string theory can be attained in principle by this route. Therefore, the string theory it can be attained even in principle via 60 CFT as an intermediate step. Okay, so um, uh, if you allow me to do various kinds of non-trivial deformations, then I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, the, the question you're asking about uh, 4D QFTs and whether you can get some from 10D string theory uh, from some other route. Uh, it actually is an open problem uh, to ask whether uh, all uh, SCFTs in lower dimensions, like four dimensions, can even be obtained from uh, the six dimensional starting point. Although there is some like broad suspicion that this is the case, or there is evidence that this might be the case, that all CFTs, SCFTs can be obtained. And so in the sense that the standard model might be viewed as a flow between two conformal fixed points, there might be a way to view it as generator from such a compactification. So I don't want to give the impression that it's impossible or not. But having said that, I'm, I'm not sure it's at any level like uh, practically useful to think about it uh, in that way. So um, anyway. Any more questions? If a lot, let us, let us thank Jonas again. Okay, I think we, we, we don't. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. See you. Thanks.